Well, hello there, and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, in this episode number 289. That's 289, the Agassino Zynga Show. How are you going? How are you feeling? Or where are you going? What are you doing? Hope you're well and all that malarkey. If it's your first time tuning into the show, please make sure you click like, smash that subscribe button, and also leave me a comment down below. And if you're listening via the podcast app, don't forget to leave me five star review download the show and share it with your friends and of course support on patreon is always welcome click the link in the show notes description as well as a pinned comment underneath this video click down there and get on the patreon i'm going to do things a bit differently with the patreon let a few of the episodes ring out but i'm going to be doing some exclusive you know one-off shows on there only that i'll be broadcasting only on the patreon account so make sure you keep an eye out for that i'll be doing one extra show a week uh, at the moment i'm doing about five so i'm going to do one extra you know on the weekend just to kind of keep that thing going might, might as well diversify the content no point of you know just putting up um the full episodes early on the patreon it's a it's a good incentive but i'm going to be putting more of an incentive in that regard and then um obviously doing all the sneaker reviews and clothing reviews and stuff for stuff i get in over this you know short period of time whilst we're all locked indoors might as well put some of that stuff behind the paywall so if you want to check out some of my sneaker reviews clothing reviews as well as the one-off show that i'm going to be doing directly on the patreon make sure you sign up on there because that content will not be available on youtube won't be available anywhere else apart from patreon so make sure you sign up to our patreon patreon.com forward slash agostino that's a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o patreon.com forward slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o direction and links can be found in the show notes as well as the pinned comments so how is everybody how have you guys been doing good great good to know how have i been pretty all right fasting's going well sober october's doing pretty well too what we're like halfway through it 15 days um i'm going i'm going all right i think abstaining for the drugs and alcohol is is easy once you decide to do something like this and it's only for the month your brain quickly just kind of gets used to it um it's weird how how quickly our brains can get used to just doing new things right you start off you know of course it's a bit difficult if you've got if you've if you're an actual addict i think that's actually um an issue that probably requires a little bit more intervention and just deciding one day willpower isn't going to change that but i think if you have if you've been overindulging in any part of your life or you know you've been allowing yourself um too many treats or whatever it may be i don't know what people vices are i think it's good just to have some time of abstinence i, I know they practice the same sort of thing um during the yeah during the roman empire i'm sure there were philosophers mostly stoics right who practiced the um philosophy of abstinence and going without certain things you know wearing dirty clothes only eating a very small you know um, selection of meals choosing from particular kind of ingredients whatever it may be just so you could train your mind train your body train your spirit train your soul to withstand and to be able to tolerate sometimes the winters of your life in it um no matter how well off you are no matter what you're doing in life no matter your parents your influence there are going to be times in your life that you're going to be not as up as you are now so it's good to have that kind of practice in your arsenal to know that you can do those things to know that you can sort of go without some of your creature comforts and again there's no need to do it nowadays because you know everything's sort of like sanitized and nerfed out for us right there's always a nice soft uh, mat to kind of you know surround you and cushion your fall especially in the uk it's very difficult to really fail and not have anything to eat the next day or a place to sleep or even sometimes a bloody internet right you could be dead out broken in, in the uk and you could still probably get on the internet that's how for the pin nice it is right compared to other places of course everyone's got their problems but with that you probably need to kind of artificially include these things in your life and for me you know new year's eve is a good one birthdays are a good one um obviously sober october is a good one there's always months in the year or times where you can purposely try to maybe correct some of your in deficiencies that you have overindulgences um gaps in your maybe thinking um you know maybe get yourself back on course in terms of direction these moments come up in life and i think you owe it yourself especially if you only get one crack at life you owe it yourself to kind of take heed to that and be like you know what i'm gonna listen i'm gonna take this as a sign let me just let me just acquiesce let me just make this change 
and again 30 days is nothing and a month is nothing it really isn't especially during winter even when um regular life was you know um regular so October was a great time for me I always found it to be very beneficial because where else am I gonna go right I've got nothing else to do um it's winter months usually especially in the industry that I'm working in with marketing there's not much of a budget to be spent in October for the most part you're wrapping up things people are you know essentially looking forward to their Christmas holidays office work is you know um a bit slow you're not pulling all-nighters um no one's you know there's a few people going out to have drinks after work but you can usually avoid those things because everyone's just rushing home to get back to their warm apartments and beds so it's pretty easy to kind of pull away i guess in the summer it gets a bit difficult because you know everyone's naturally socializing and hanging outside and you know making the best of you know a short summer that they get in london but you can avoid most things in the winter mate i went to i went to berlin um during what what, what was i doing in berlin i think i was doing dry january or something and i went to the Bergheim like that right i went to like an adidas party that was sponsored yeah and i it was it you know it was a it was a it was a i think i went to no yeah i went to an event where they were launching the first um do you remember the adidas nmd um the first one the, with the french sort of colorways on it what was that one adidas nmd pk something right pkr1 i don't know what number that is what, is that the one i'm thinking of uh images adidas nm let me just do adidas nmg og og that should be the one adidas nmd og yeah that's the one right so i was in berlin right when they launched this shoe it's a prime knit uh r1 so they launched this shoe in some warehouse somewhere this amazing space that was like a warehouse but it wasn't it was obviously you know a, a pretty well done up um space sort of like similar to what we have here in the UK, in london with protein studios with these weird um illuminating light things panels on the outside loads of squares and it was a massive queue outside right huge huge queue but luckily you know the place i was working at we had um some connections or the or the you know the people i went with they had the connections let me not put it on the workplace the people i went with they were the ones i had the links so i just tagged along and obviously it was a who's who what's what of you know whatever that scene is in germany or in berlin right that sort of like streetwear hipster fashion youtube music crew they're all there trying to get in we managed to get tickets not only to get in but also we managed to get wristbands to um to allow us to get like free mixers i guess for free at the bar because there was already a free beer available because of the collaboration that adidas did with carlsberg but they also oh no was it heineken whatever which one it was um there but obviously mixers weren't free you had to pay for the mixes, but if you had a special wristband, which I had, or which we all did have, um, you were able to get mixes for free. And I abstained from drinking that entire trip, you know, of course, until the end of January. And it was fairly easy. Like, it, again, it gave me a different appreciation for Berlin because I go there nearly every year. So to go there sober and just enjoy the city for what it is was pretty cool, too. Don't get me wrong. It was kind of frustrating to, you know, you go on a company's dime and then you'll get given the flipping king's treatment getting shown around by all the necessary movers and shakers in that city you get taken to this amazing party where you see kano one of my favorite mcs growing up right somebody i listened to on pirate radio you know since i was in secondary school um performing on stage absolutely shelling but then you don't have the ability to <laughs> drink at the event frustrating but not that big of a deal again once you tell yourself to do something or in my case anyway it's pretty easy to follow through it especially when it's just a short period of time and if anything, to be completely honest, it's quite nice to know too that you're not an addict for myself anyway. It's quite nice to know, to remind yourself, hey, you know, I don't have an issue with this stuff. I can stop when I want, you know what I mean? Um, pretty easily. There's not, there's no like, you know, it's not like I'm walking past the, an aisle and flipping Morrisons on Asda's or Tesco's and shaking when I pass the Cronenbergs and it's not that big of a deal really. Um, I'm not hiding drinks in bloody, you know, underneath my sock or something and swigging it and putting stuff in my coffee that's not as big as an issue as i thought it would be um which has been pretty cool because it does get difficult you know especially when you move out and you got your own place and you're just like you know you start to get a bit cheeky you know what i mean because you got your own literally legitimately got your own bar and you know i can entertain myself pretty well for the most part i make myself happy as they say <laughs> which sounds a bit crude but you know what i mean so it's difficult you know you can get a little bit overindulgent you can get a little bit lax of it and start you know 
a couple of bottles turns into two, two bottles turns into some massive glasses. You start looking at flipping how to make ice online and shit. It starts to become really crazy. So I'm glad I've got this time period to do my thing. So that has been going well. So is the training, loads of weightlifting, loads of running, um, reading a bunch as well. Just, you know, trying to keep myself in tip top condition so that once, once the clock strikes 12 or one on November the 1st, but for now, pretty good, man. Pretty good. Let me know if you're doing anything for Sober October. I'd love to know what you are giving up for this uh, month of sobriety. And if you are still hanging on in there, what are some of the tips and tricks that you have? Let me know in the comments down below. Okay, let's move on and get to some more interesting topics. Um, first, this weird um, reaction to Harry Maguire's red card for England versus Denmark the other day. Of course, you know, most of you are aware that I'm a massive, massive, massive Man United fan, of course, right? And um, Harry Maguire, our record centre-back signing, hasn't necessarily been pulling up any trees recently for United. He's been a bit lackluster. There's been talk about him supposedly needing a partner to bring the best out of him, which is really ridiculous considering that he cost us 85 million, right? Considering he's meant to be a marquee signing, considering people are talking about him in the same vein as a Virgil van Dijk, for him to need a partner for him to play with his best is just boggles belief. But cool, let's say that is true. You know, part defensive partnerships are about partnerships. You need a yin and a yang. You know, if you've got somebody that's very aggressive on the front foot and, you know, slams into players, you need somebody maybe a bit more composed next to him so they can balance each other out. Think of the classic partnership of Rio Ferdinand and Emmanuel Village at Man United during our glory years right amazing partnership think of I don't know who is it William Gallas and John Terry right in terms of athleticism and maybe a little bit more nous tactically very very great compliments so um that's okay but then of course what transpires you know Harry Maguire gets into all sorts of bother when he goes on his Greek trip. Believe what you want to believe, but what happened there, whether or not his sister did get stabbed by some Albanian um, human traffickers or whatever the story is, or is it just, you know, Harry Maguire went to Greece, got some Dutch courage in him, drank a bit too much, and decided to get mouthy to police officers, and they obviously weren't having it, and it transpired what transpired. He comes back, does a really weird R. Kelly esque interview trying to beg for forgiveness very rehearsed very scripted very much out of the playbook of a neil ashton or whoever's handling the pr for united didn't really buy that at all and again doesn't really matter in my opinion i have no care about what players get out to outside of the football pitch except if it's something really egregious but for the most part if it involves speeding if it involves you know extra um extra marital issues um whatever i could care less as long as the person's performing on the pitch i don't really mind it too much it continues and then of course his performances start to wane he starts to look completely terrible now don't get me wrong he's playing for united we're probably one of the worst run clubs in europe um the toxicity and the just level of incompetence is kind of seeping down from the bottom to the top from the top to the bottom but just a basic defending the being able to mark a person the being able to control a ball the being able not to lose your man to being able to clear your lines he's just not performing at the necessary level at all right he's just not doing it and it's okay to just call it out but of course because he's the main eyed captain he's an english boy he plays for england he's one of the marquee signings that we have at the club there's this protection racket around him this like hey man we're a great defense squad this is bizarre and then the fast forward so now where he gets sent off against denmark right he plays pretty like last day picks up two needless yellow cards especially the second one that he got that eventually sent him that it essentially he sent him off where he takes a heavy touch to a ball that looked pretty easy to control it's he has like let's say 15 maybe let's say 12 to be nice 12 yards of room around him to control the ball and to move into the space he miscontrols it he obviously then pushes the ball further towards um the, Dem the danish player who obviously tries to latch onto the ball before Maguire comes in he misses the ball by a millisecond bang takes the player out second yellow card easy decision to make and then afterwards like a reaction even during a match like oh i feel sorry for harry Maguire. how bad it is how much pressure he has on his shoulder blah 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 and none more so summed up the disgusting over reaction to protect the guy then this reaction from Jamie Redknapp on BT Sport or whatever it was when he was talking about Harry Maguire. Listen to what he has to say here. Players can handle it. Some players could play with things going on in their, you know, their social life or whatever's going on and it doesn't bother them. That's then their sanctuary. 
but some players, others, can't. They go on there and they carry it onto them with a pitch. You don't know what's going on in people's minds. We're all very quick to judge. I mean, people ripping him apart on social media, saying, oh, it's the worst England player I've ever seen. But you don't know how Probably somebody is. feels when they go on the field. They're two, they're two errors that, yes, they might look really simple, but he's making a lot of individual mistakes right now. But he's got to pick himself up. You've got to be, a, you know, you've got to show something. You've got to bring something, you know, and I think you'll need a good support system around him. And I've got no doubt, because of the man that he is, he'll come back and he'll get, he'll come. Now, of course, Jamie Redknapp's talking absolute dog's bollocks on it, but yeah, I get him, right? He needs to support his fellow England pro. It is what his you know, support do you want to do. The issue that I have with this is that no amount of sympathy was extended to the likes of Paul Pogba, Raheem Sterling or any other player who doesn't happen to share the same complexion and same, you know, passport details as maybe Mahara Maguire did when they're going through bad spells. No one talks about mental health when it concerns players that don't necessarily serve an agenda, that aren't necessarily categorized as the quote unquote media bad boys. None of that... Um, grace none of that um, humility none of that understanding none of that rationality has ever come into place when you're discussing those players and that's the issue no one minds calling out a pope because of his poor performances even if you do attach the price tag to it but don't overblow minute top minute issues such as you know paul Popper going to his brother's wedding and dancing whilst he's got a quote-unquote injury why is that such a big deal if he performs on a pitch why is it also a big deal of the colour of the hair that he does? Why is it a big deal about Raheem Sterling's tattoo? Why is it a big deal if he decides to move to another club because he wants to make more money or because he wants to win Premier League titles, which he's done with Man City when he left Liverpool? Why do those things matter if the person's performing on a pitch? Now, if we were to look at the lens, if we were to kind of, um, you know, surmise or hypothesize what the media reaction would be if... Um, Paul Pogba happened to be in Bora Bora and got into a bit of a scuffle with some police officers. What do you think the story would be? Would it happen? Would, would he have got the same amount of grace? Would he have got the same amount of understanding as Harry Maguire did? During the back, during that story, when it was even developing, we didn't have many details. Journalists were falling over themselves to try and find a narrative that would suit and paint Harry Maguire in the best light possible. Oh, it was his sister. Oh, was one of his friends got pushed. Oh, this she was backing up. Like, everyone was trying to look for an excuse when really, maybe there is no real rational excuse. Maybe it just was the case of a couple of lads going on holiday and getting a little bit too giddy. Yeah, right? having a few too many drinks in them and thinking that they could take on the police. It happens. British people are notorious for going to um, Mediterranean countries and causing an absolute ruckus. It should be no different if you're a footballer. It probably is worse considering his stature of what he, you know, uh, of the club that he plays for and just general his profession and obviously um his wealth that should make complete sense but let's just treat all players the same let's kind of treat players um you know based on the what they're what they're doing on the pitch if they're not performing you call them out for it no matter who they are that's the issue we have at hand i don't necessarily mind the the, the stick that harry i don't and again the stick that harry Maguire is getting to is completely normal you pay for the biggest one of the biggest clubs in the world the one of the biggest if not the biggest club in the uk even though we haven't won flipping anything for a while it's normal that he would be getting this amount of scrutiny. That's what happens when you sign for Man United. You're under the big lights now. The attention is far greater. You can't mess up as you were previously. Your performances have to be in like your performances have to be to a certain level. As does your conduct outside the pitch. It is what it is. And if you can't handle it, which he clearly is showing no temperament of handling that, then you move on. You sign somebody else. The same. The same. Um, the same uh, people that were kind of getting on flipping David Luiz for making numerous mistakes, you know, Mustafi and stuff. What, how much worse is Harry Maguire playing compared to those two guys? Especially David Luiz, who's had a, a far longer career in the Premier League than um, Harry Maguire has had. And he's a far better professional. He's, a, he's, he's, he's shown us a lot more than what Harry Maguire has over, over his career. I said it from the beginning anyway. I never thought Harry Maguire was an £85 million uh, worth defender. I thought we overpaid him to the max. He's never worth £85 million. He's probably no better than a Lewis Dunk. That's not even to disparage his name. But if you're a Lewis Dunk and you're watching Harry Maguire trotting around for England or Man United, you're going to be a little bit aggrieved. Tchaikovsky at Burnley is probably on the same level as, as Harry Maguire too. And those aren't elite. And again, I'm only saying in the terms of if you're a Man United and you're signing an elite English centre back, you want to ensure that you're signing somebody of the standard of the best centre back that we have in a league now, which is Virgil van Dijk. 
if he's not of that standard and he's not going to be a difference maker of that level, then what's the point of signing this player? You might as well stick with a, with some academy graduates. You might as well stick with a low knee or something. There's no point spunking that much amount of money on somebody and then telling the fans or convincing everybody, which, you know, may not PR team are doing a good job of, or he needs other players around him to make him look better. Like what? People aren't, weren't having that with Paul Pogba, but Paul Pogba's got far more evidence in his locker to show that if he's played without the burden of having to defend in the two, in a double pivot in front of the back four, he's actually a lot better player. But what's Harry Maguire shown us so far? That he needs to play with, a, what, a competitive number, what, a competitive partner next to him, as well as a competitive centre-back, as well as a competitive right-back, sorry, and left-back. He needs to have three world-class defenders next to him to look good. What what player doesn't look better with world class players around him? It's shocking to say the least, man. So that's again, I don't have an issue with with um with people trying to look out for Harry Maguire's mental health. That's all fine and dandy, but let's keep the same injury to all players, isn't it? If we don't mind. Anyway, what do I know in that regard? What the flip do I know? Then I actually was thinking today because obviously we've kind of changed um we've got a new tier system here in the uk to allow people to kind of you know um go around and do no, they must have you. to do what they need to do in coronavirus here in the uk has been dealt with a bit haphazardly as most places are um the government has actually announced this where is this article here they've announced this just now we've got a new free tech um restrictions coming in says the following uh most most of the country is in the lower tier medium but millions of people in the north and, uh, and the midlands are facing extra curbs to household mixing liverpool region is the only area under the current toughest rules with pubs and bars serving meals closed not serving most quite sorry um government health officials are due to meet later to discuss the possibility of greater manchester lancashire and some other areas joining that top tier right and obviously there's loads of stuff kicking off on the social about it the manchester uh, mayor has come out and essentially said hey if the government decides to put us in the top tier which means you know bars and pubs and gyms will be closed which essentially decimate um the local economy he's going to take them to court so loads of really really pressing um demands and things at risk or at, on the line here especially during covid and with the lack of you know direction coming from the top and then i saw this video that i'm gonna play here that reminded me of the good old days of what it's like and i think most people have felt like this have you ever gone online and seen a clip or video from a concert or from a rave and just been like whoa that's so weird isn't it right and i mentioned it prior about how quickly the body and the mind gets used to just new routines now we're just so used to not shaking people's hands we're so not used to hugging people when still not used to going to pack nightclubs and when we see videos on in my case when i see videos and clips of pack nightclubs and festivals it sort of kind of throws me off a little bit i'm like what the hell is this about this must be this this seems like it's something from the 90s and you check the date it's uploaded and it's only been uploaded in 2012 anyway this isn't the case this is like a older video from 2013 supposedly but i'm assuming it might be even a while ago from there it's from a dutch festival it looks like um, so it says here, yeah, um, a while ago, our reporter went to Thunderdome and had a good time. So I think Thunderdome is a hardcore Gabba night. And they basically went around and interviewed loads of peeled up attendees out there. And, you know, their eyeballs are the size, the size of CDs and they're all flipping, jaws are swinging. But I just love the vibe because it reminds me um, of some of the better parts of rave culture, right? Of course, the music is amazing. You go to see some great DJs, some of the clubs, the sound systems, but just the different freaky characters you meet on the dance floor because sometimes going to the toilet getting a drink um having a breathe in a smoking area um this perfectly encapsulates so let me play the clip of you now and i'll read out some of the subtitles because a few of the guys are speaking dutch it's a question i had my day of silence or uh, for my mindfulness course today and this is where i was mindfulness today come here today what have you Say so, what? Well, look at his eyes. Look at those eyes. A day of silence of my mindfulness course. Still the dag for my cursus mindfulness. Oh, it's oh, still the dag? Silence. Yeah, we in the time to see Yes, you're at the wrong place. It's not quite here. Eh, met the train. Yeah, that's the question. Look at this question here. How do you end up here? I end up here by train. Look at those flipping eyes. Right? <laughs> that is what raving is about, mate. <laughs> who else doesn't miss this? So who else does miss this, actually? That's the actual question. 
going to rave and having your eyelids just dancing all over the place, colors of CDs, jaws swinging, trying to act normal. It's, it's funny though because everyone has that face where you're trying to act normal, right? You're trying to, um, you're trying to remain as a uh, put well composed and well put together as you can, but you know deep down you're a complete shit show. Okay. I'm actually a hardcore fan. I switched sides. When did you switch sides? Look at the eyes. That plan's going bonkers, of course. <laughs> I work out five times a week. Jeez. And Pilatus also. Pilatus as well. Do you also Pilatus? Pilatus. What is Pilatus? Do you also run rondjes lopen? You gotta love the Dutch. Rondjes lopen. Doing laps. Yeah, yeah. Af en toe, af en toe, maar Milde is like stop, don't wake up. What a moment, get it? Is it? Have fun tonight. And? And? Ow! Who is it? Ow! Okay, that was. Especially for this, you come here. Ow! Dat is je lievelings eten. What's your favorite kind of food to these two girls? Um, Look at that jaw. Look at that jaw. Pizza, I've had a lot of pizza, so I don't really like it anymore. Pizza, but I've had a lot of pizza. Just imagine what those bartenders have seen in these festivals or these sort of raves. Just imagine the stories they must have, man. Oh, that's what you always got to make nice with bartenders. They always usually have the best bands, man, in terms of what they actually see day to day. Especially if it's a, you know, a, a festival or a party that's going to go in for the weekend. They've definitely got some stories. Dus dat vind ik tegenwoordig niet meer heel lekker. Wat staat op je tatoeage, op je onderarm? Wat is je tattoo say? Mijn geboorte datum. Mijn day of birth. Ben je die vergeten dan? Oh, je vergeten het. Ik blijf gewoon werken een beetje toch? En dan moet ik maar een man vinden die veel geld verdient. Sorry, dam, boldam, geen keer. You come specially here for to for this? My best beer is boldam. It's now is. Yeah. Look at Spanish guys to me. My best beer is what or Italian? Boldam. <laughs> going absolutely nuts who doesn't miss this come on man raving like this look at that just absolutely going for it look at those eyes look at those eyes he cannot absorb all that hell <laughs> all those light waves coming into his pupils like what the hell is this Diamonds dancing. And uh, yeah, ik heb er heel veel zin in. Ja, <laughs> Jij ook? Hoe is het? Ja, I was like, it. Yeah, fine. En wat heb je ermee gedaan? What did you do? What did you do with? Met de hond. My dog. Ja, weet niet. Ik was klein. Ik was klein. <laughs> in de vuilnisbak. Ik weet het niet. Ik wil even een drankje halen. I want to get a drink. Hij snap ik met mij. I can't stand you want to uh, get with me. Nee. Not really. <laughs> Wie ben je hier dan? Uh, mijn vriend. My boyfriend. Okay. Ben je een professioneel bodybuilder? Nee hoor. <laughs> Ik dus wel. This is insane. The amount of absolute wounded wobbly people is mad. I not only know. 25% of the ravers here, I know 50% of the artists. It's that brilliant. I just love coming here. I feel special. Even behind those thick glasses, you can see those eye pupils are dancing. But bless her, look at the passion, look at the vibes, look at the love for the nightlife. This is what we're all about. Special, I feel wanted, loved, appreciated, just for being me. I have that only done. See? It's the best thing that there is. When have you let it sit? Last year. I'm very proud of you. Then up. I can do what I like. I can be who I am, and everybody loves me, and it's brilliant. I never get that anywhere else except in hardcore, and that's why hardcore will never die. She's a legend, isn't it? She's a legend. You can replace hardcore with techno, hip hop, whatever music you're into. Um, that's what kind of makes it special, isn't it? Being able to go in these environments, these arenas, and surround yourself with people, like-minded people who kind of love the same thing you do, sharing that experience, let yourself, let your hair down, be comfortable, not be afraid of showing out, not be afraid of, you know, dancing, looking silly. 
because you're all essentially there for the same thing. You're essentially there for the shared love, right? The shared interest that you have. There's no need to pretend anymore like you do in your normal life, you know, putting on several masks in order to blend in with all the normies that surround you. You can be your own little freak in your own little freaky world. And we're all missing out on that at the moment, isn't it? Um, most people are anyway, I'd assume, if you're a fan of nightlife and clubbing and shit. It's a hard time at the moment, but we must persevere. We must hang on in there, guys. Let's not um, let go of that situation. But yeah, what a what an epic, 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 epic video. Those pupils were dancing in it. Absolutely dancing. Legends. Let's move on. Um, we've got some weird ones as well. We've got this tweet that I see earlier online. Um, someone shared an image of theatres in London that are open, right? This is someone's tweet saying, can't have fans at football, rugby or F1, can't have live music at small venues, arenas or festivals, can't be in a group more than six people, but we can open a theatres, lovelies. London played in last night. 1,000 people, right? So that's like less than half in a 2,286 capacity theatre. So I'm sure they did social distancing. They've got some spacing here, right? As you can tell, people can't sit in those seats over there. Um, not everyone's wearing a mask because they're drinking, some of them and you're eating, but this is insane. The kind of, um, I don't know how they rationalize stuff like this. Like, how do you decide which sectors of the industry are allowed to reopen? What's the deciding factor here? Because from what I know, you know, aerosols and droplets and shit, they're still going to spread. No matter if you're sitting snow close to somebody, even if you've got a mask on, staying indoors for a prolonged period of time is still going to expose you to the virus. So why should that be any more... Um, why should that be any more allowed than going to a football stadium per se football stadiums as well they're usually you know they're not uh roofed places right you can generally have you know people their football stadiums are generally open up to the open to the elements so there is a side and aspect to it where you can essentially manage that a lot better than you can manage a theater especially from outbreak side right you can have people sitting on certain stands wherever it may be this is just insane or even light clubs you could have nightclubs with limited capacity just give them the ability to put on a club night. Give them the ability to sell tickets on the front door, except for selling tables and stuff. It doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. It's so utterly bizarre. And I don't know why we're not kicking up, especially people within my scene, in a DJing, underground music scene, dance music scene. Why we're not kicking up much more of a fuss about this? This is maddening. There's a part of me that thinks, again, I don't like to get conspiratorial, but there's a part of me that thinks, hold on. They're, they're allowing stuff like theaters to be reopened which essentially you know service the middle class and upper class in this country but they're not allowing the quote-unquote working class um industries to reopen such as bars and clubs which are owned by not these mega corporations but people that look like me and you right um football clubs which are essentially supporting an entire economy around the stadium where i can imagine you know lo your local team whether it's late or west ham they're gonna you know they're really st the lack of um, those stadiums being open and selling tickets is affecting you know it has a knock-on effect on everybody pubs are probably not taking as much money chicken shops kebab places primark like whatever everything around the, um, the football stadium suffers because they're not able to open and sell tickets so this is just utterly weird it doesn't make no sense i don't understand what's going on why this is allowed why somehow one place is allowed to open and one place isn't again I'm okay with people saying, hey, you can't reopen because our science says so-and-so, such-and-such, so sorry. Fair enough, but show us the evidence. Show people the evidence. Let everyone make them inform this. And again, I'm not even someone, this is not someone coming from, I'm not coming from the point of view of like, I just want to go out and rave under any circumstances. I probably won't go back out again until things are safe in my head or I feel like, you know, things are some way back to some kind of normality. But I also understand that people have livelihoods, right? People's careers, people's whole business surrounds live music and events and all that stuff. And they've been essentially denied the ability to make a living for what, six, seven months? with hardly any assistance from the government, right? The furlough schemes ended. There's no uh, there's no other furloughs going to come off the back of that, if you believe what Rishi Sunak has been saying. They've got this fund for support in certain segments of the arts, but again, not everyone's getting it. So to, uh, and I assume some people just don't want to have handouts. They want to be able to make their own money, right? They want to be able to pay their own rent, uh, make their own way as they have done previously. So to, to, to kind of inform the people and tell them, hey, you're not allowed to open under any circumstances, but... We're going to reopen these theatres down in the West End and you're not allowed to ask questions. It's just insane. Or ask for any evidence as to why they decided to do it that way. 
because they have evidence to say hey these theaters are more safer than to go into a nightclub then cool right but i don't think they have the evidence they really don't because it doesn't make any sense they're all stacked up on top of each other like you would be in a nightclub they're all supposedly socially into the space but you know it doesn't matter how many doesn't matter how many chairs you keep free there's still a lot of people clumped together right not everybody i'd assume was wearing a mask throughout the entire time they were in there they're taking people's temperatures but again a temperature gauge isn't the best indication of someone is positive for covid or not it's all really really utterly bizarre and just again just goes to demonstrate the you know the the levels of inequality in the uk far outweigh you know just racial lines right there are far 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 deeper things at play in the uk that really make things super difficult for people you know operating within little niche subcultures and sub you know yeah subcultures um industries whatever it may be right it really makes it difficult because they really do stack up the cards against you and this is another example of it just utterly 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 disgusting stuff to see there but hey i guess i shouldn't be surprised really in a standard procedure next on the list we have um the introduction the introduction or the revel the, the revealing of the apple iphone 12 um and i'm a big fan of it i love it man um it reminds me of the my favorite iphone which is the, the iphone 4 i think that was the last iphone that steve Jobs presented on stage before he passed away um so it holds a special part in my heart being a big steve Jobs fan and being a bit of an apple fanboy of course but i still think objectively it's probably the best designed iphone ever uh that and probably the first iphone right so you got the iphone uh one og however i don't know what that is is it iphone one the first one that was announced on stage right that's probably the, one of the most in terms of what is what it did for iphone designs right i think this is definitely the one that sort of like set the precedent so you got this phone is obviously one let's look at this on screen so that is obviously number one phone in terms of design and what it did right you know henceforth i think every phone that came out after that basically looked like the apple iphone right they didn't necessarily change the form factor everyone had the same sort of camera placement the same home button he you know steve jobs and apple completely you know rewrote what smartphones were looking like because i remember back then you remember back in the day when smartphones were like mini laptop thingies or weird kind of blackberry type devices for somebody to finally go hey we're gonna do away with the keypad and just make it touch screen do you remember that was also the presentation where he's like oh it's, it's a music player it's a phone internet browser music player, and it's all one thing it was a phone to reveal then it had the keyboard that disappears and comes back to life again that was all obviously kind of like you know really pushing things forward and then of course the apple iphone 4 which again i maintain is definitely the best designed iphone in terms of just looking wise as a product as an industrial design item i think you know everything from the band around it on the outside to the glass front and the glass back the glass back i think i remember that was that this also might have been the phone if i remember correctly this might have been the phone that leaked this might have been the first full leak of an iPhone 2, if I remember precisely. Do you remember that story about that guy that went to a park, went to out on a drink somewhere and you think he had his iPhone 4 in a case that made it look like the iPhone 3 or something? Um, he gets too drunk, he leaves at the bar, some geek picks it up, a happenstance, tries to give it back to the guy, but the phone got bricked and then um, it didn't get handed back to him the guy goes back home takes it and inspects it and then starts discovers that it's a case and it's not actually the, the phone and then it sees the uh, apple iphone phone underneath it and then he tries to send it back to apple they don't respond and then he ends up selling it to i think not could gizmodo i think he ends up selling it to gizmodo for you know we'll have much money he sells it for and then they run the story of oh this is the next iphone and that was the first time we actually got leaks because before that you know now since steve Jobs passing not sure if it's a purposeful thing that apple have done but now we get leaks from apple all the time they're always leaking stuff right whether it's from third-party manufacturers of cases or whatever or other periphery accessories we're always getting leaks about cameras and 
form factor it's there's no real secrets anymore especially if you're keeping attention if you're paying attention so this was the again one of the first things i remember of that being a big deal and obviously the white color which i had and i dutifully dutifully lost a couple of times but it's definitely my favorite iphone 100 percent hands down but and i like the reintroduction of the new iphone because it reminds me of the apple iphone 4 this is the advert from apple showcasing just what it looks like play for you now It was great, man. I love it. The notch is still there. I love the fact that it's, you know, they've tried to kind of get it as um, bezel-less as possible, edge-to-edge -edge screen, but I just wish there was something that could be done about this notch. I know MK and BHD has a big problem with it as well, and I do, I do as well. They've, we've come a long way from the chin, right? Everyone didn't, you know, every brand had a little chin that they sort of were trying to force down our throats. Um, it would be nice if someone could work out how to get rid of this. I'm not sure what engineering or um, innovation or screen innovations needs to be made in order to get that job done, but surely, you know, sooner or later, that's gonna have to be done. Oh, 5G as well, that's a big deal. Did you, oh, and talking about 5G, did you hear about the, the thing about 5G is that supposedly in the UK, they're pushing for 5g because it's going to benefit football clubs and betting companies because that's going to mean you can watch you can live stream sports as they happen as opposed to having a delay which we have now at the moment with terrestrial tv and satellite radio blah, blah, blah. so if they're able to um implement 5g across the country especially in the uk and roll it out and it gets widely adopted there is a possibility to you know increase the amount of revenue that's made from gambling and of course if clubs are then able to sell individual rights to their game you could effectively sell you know pay-per-view um you know london derbies or merseyside derbies right for like you know let's say anywhere between two pound uh per stream or two pound you know yeah two nineteen and anywhere to between ten dollars so imagine how much money these um you know football clubs would be making if they can sell the right to watch the show watch the match sorry um via 5g and it'd be instantaneous it'd be direct to your phone no delay no lag or anything it'd be nuts so that's definitely something that i'm sure behind the scenes apple's definitely got a bit of a stake in it too i wouldn't be surprised if they decide to come out with some sort of streaming platform or something or whatever not streaming platform maybe something to do with sports tie-in that will maybe make any sense as we go on <laughs> Oh, that's so cool, isn't it? The phone looks amazing. Edit share, Dolby Vision. Light mode, of course. And I'm... And I've got to be honest, if I do get one, it's probably just the 12 and the Mini. Not the Max or the Pro. No big deal about that. But it's flipping great, though. Four Timberanics, Mark Shit. The mag safe is the mag safe is funny, isn't it? I, I, I find that I find that hilarious. They're bringing back you know old technology, so it's it's sort of like a bit of an ode to all the old tech, right? In terms of the obviously the design and the form factor, and then reintroducing uh, mag safe uh, charging to it makes you know. Um, I guess overall in terms of, um, you know, future proofing or whatever that term is, they're obviously trying to phase out any sort of like ports on the phone. So you can probably expect, you know, future iPhones to have no headphone jack, to have no way you can actually plug any sort of cables into it whatsoever. It's just going to be all done wirelessly or maybe, you know, yeah, wirelessly in some capacity. So that makes complete sense. But again, just you know there was nothing wrong with magsafe in the beginning and then you know as apple decided to kind of you know move away from it and give us um what USB C, us USB C cables to charge our things with but you know just doesn't make no sense that way else oh. and of course it clicks into a wallet too that looks pretty cool oh, man. resistant as well which is awesome mm -hmm. 
it's my uncle there chilling with the mini that's what it's probably gonna end up looking like in my hands but i love the mini mini looks flipping great and them such as me right i'm sure everyone else loves their phones to be smaller right i don't understand what happened with tech where suddenly especially when i was in school all the phones were like really small right nokia was like in a race with sony ericsson or whoever else was a computer at the time to just keep them making their phones as small as they could then as soon as soon the smartphones get introduced because i remember i had one of the first smartphones they did on free it might have been like an alcatel or something right one of those big massive behemoth phones that you could browse and stuff on and it was huge it was like the size of a sky remote right it was massive at the time but you know, you kind of did it. You kind of, you kind of put up with it because it was the first sort of iteration of a phone that could browse the internet, watch videos on. Right? I think that was a phone that I maybe discovered Ronaldinho's clips from him playing at Gremio, and then we went to PSG. You know, that was when you kind of fell in love with Ronaldinho via those phones back in the day, and stumbling on random websites where they had compilations of Ronaldinho's skills, like madness. But then you would imagine, especially when your iPhone got. It, was introduced to the market that since then and again since steve just passing iphones have just got bigger and bigger so have other smartphone developers right sony make a big fat iphone so does google um so does microsoft like loads of people make really big phones and um, it doesn't seem to make sense especially when you consider the fashion nowadays right everyone's got flipping tight trousers or tight jeans or tight jackets everything's tight we don't live in the 90s right so to have all these massive phones but then everyone wearing really small clothes it's really counterintuitive but then on the other hand i guess with everyone wearing these little side bags and pouches and shit or the little gunman bags it probably makes sense that they'd make them bigger because they'd assume most people would probably stuff those into those kind of bags as opposed to on their person but usually whenever i've seen people out and, out and about everyone's either got their phone in their hand or they've got it in their pockets right they don't have I mean, their pockets or their trousers they don't usually place it in like a side bag or something but yeah iphone 12 coming out soon so keep an eye on that one i'm definitely going to get a 12 if not the mini but the 12 is definitely kind of ticking my boxes on that regard so let's move on what else do we have here to talk about ba, 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 ba. We move on from that oh this one's a mad one in it covid is doing some mad things to people right so I, i'm not sure where where was this in america this was in nashville tennessee right so for some reason i'm not sure what it is about news broadcasters in america but for some reason they seems to really kind of um elicit a weird response from some of the local people that live in that community now it might have to do with fake news it might have to do with you know what you call it what's those people called the QAnon people right who are very skeptical of the media msn mainstream media lamestream media however you kind of tile them so when you're sat at home on facebook you know um getting yourself all angry about some broadcast that you saw online and then you find you peek out your window and you're seeing that same truck that you kind of have deemed to be the devil now reporting out your neighborhood you're definitely going to freak out but this is another level so this i'll paint the scene for you if you're just listening there's a young um reporter a young woman um you know fiddling around with a microphone getting acquainted and you know just setting up a shot and then suddenly out of nowhere she turns left of the shot and she sees this weird gentleman rolling up to her or making some sort of noises and of course you know her woman's senses go off she steps steps aside and then all hell breaks loose but i'll play the video now for you so you guys can actually see what's going on here hey you all right what's up you okay and then look at him some guy with no no shoes on um balding you know severely obese and just an absolute man i don't know if he's off stuff or just you know annoyed that his uh, local community is getting covered in a bad light i told you Pushing the camera. I love the haze, the shouting at him as if he's some sort of dog, right? As if that's gonna get his attention and make him kind of get startled and run away. He's a grown ass man. He decided to come over and cause a ruckus. Like you best put up your hands, and he's ready for a fight, <laughs> even though he doesn't look like it. But he definitely is. Hey! God damn it! Get up. Go away. Get away. Clenchy his fist. Doing what? Go away. Push. Go. Get away. Go. 
It took me to like a pet. Let him go. He's getting spun around in circles. Like, he's trying to do something. And then the, the best bit's coming up. They're four. Look at this. <laughs> the best bit's four. <laughs> Look at that. That's a that's a defeat. That's that's a defeated man if ever I've seen it. Right. Because it's one thing coming out of your house going, I'm going to set those guys right. And it's another thing ended up on the floor with your bare ass on the concrete, no underwear on, you know, and then struggling to stand up as well. Because, you know, for sure, he doesn't, people like this don't end up on the floor too, you know, too often. He's usually got some sort of mobility scooter or some sort of assistance, um, some sort of, you know, lift that takes him upstairs, um, some sort of a bath seat that allows him to probably you know uh, shit quarter sitting up right like a quarter squat so for him to landing on the floor with his bum out like this is a real struggle and as you can see it does really struggle to get up he's trying to peel over leaning look, look, at that. look at that he's coming up in the stages mate and he's out of breath as well look he's out of breath he's dizzy you insulted my partner. <laughs> we can press charges against you. I hope you know that. They're all jumping in the car like he's a zombie. <laughs> Locking the doors. In the car. <laughs> the cameraman's breathing get really hard. Him. But get yeah, this is the this is the angle you want to see. Boy, Look at this. Get away from him. No. I'm get recording away. you right now. Stop it. Leave him alone. The cameraman isn't, you know isn't exactly Tyson through himself, is it? But he grabs a hold of his shirt and look at this. All he does is just spin him around a couple Wait, times. Go. Leave him alone, I'll call he's the police. Off. Look at that. Let's be Sir, get away from him. It's less of a punch and more so of a of like a knuckle tap in it really. Let Sir, get away from him. Get away from him. And then boom. That's what you get. <laughs> What's wrong with you? It's like what is that? How, did he, what, how Sir, did he even up. how did he even fall over from that position? So let's see, he punches him in the face. Let's, little tap, right? Boom. Let, Sir, get away from him. And as he's about to get away Oh, from okay, him. I see, I see. That's what lit. The Sir, cameraman away. steps away, which is a good thing. As he's leaning into him to grab the back of his shirt, the cameraman steps away. And as he's stepping away, he creates a bit of a gap. And then in that gap, um, the man in the red shirt, who looks a little bit like Ron Jeremy's father, struggles for balance and then ends up on his back for some reason. Get away from him. Get away from him. <laughs> That's what you get. That's to be what fair. You get. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> bare ass on the floor that must be cold look at that face <laughs> what's wrong with you i don't know ma'am <laughs> this is a perfect sort of like um screenshot from that you know that sort of um what's that freeze frame you're probably wondering how i got in this position right that sort of thing in it oh my god leave him alone oh epic 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 video again covid is making a mockery out of most humans during this crazy time and you know maybe you have to extend some sympathy to that young gentleman there anyway continuing on we have some very interesting news in the podcasting space that might have some consequences with the one uh what the fire and the kid and brendan Schaub and brian callan and all that stuff that's going on at the moment so as you guys are aware you know uh, Brian Callan got himself into some hot bother with some allegations of sexual assault, some pretty serious ones and some pretty non-serious ones, but essentially his career has been put on standstill due to these allegations. Now, whether or not they're right or wrong, who knows, who cares? At this moment in time, we live in a world where if someone accuses you, your career's over and that's it. But there obviously is this other side of the story where... <clears throat> Sorry about that. The Fire and the Kid have spent a long time building up a pretty credible, well-known, well-regarded podcast that, don't get me wrong, has fallen off for the last few years, but there's no denying the amount of time that they've spent in the trenches, you know, building up their podcast, building up their fan base, and essentially providing a platform for themselves to show off their talents and their skills and use as a launching pad to get all the other deals they're getting off, right? So you, there's no coincidence that the podcast blows up and gets successful. Brian Callen then becomes finally a successful um, actor, a comedic actor in Hollywood, and Brendan Shaw gets, you know, numerous amount of opportunities that he's been getting from showtime to brand deals and collaborations this all come off the basis of being able to work on obviously um the fire and the kid and obviously be able to use that podcast as a platform to do the other projects now of course with brian cannon getting in trouble you'd assume 
that providing a kid could also be a, a bit of a uh, place that he for you know a welcome respite from the craziness of the outside world to have a platform that you share with your friend where you can essentially share your view on the matters clear up your name respond to allegations whatever it may be right you just hope that'll be the case but that's that's not what happened what happened instead was that uh, brian cannon was swiftly removed from the uh, the fire and the kid podcast um, obviously they first tried to get him on there and rename the show that didn't work out because they're owned by this company called cast media which is a sort of production management company that i'm assuming um probably does a lot of work for them in terms of making sure that they get the right brand collaborations and advertisements and all that sort of stuff and it also is an understanding that they might be a part of cast media that handles some of the audio production and the video production and some of the maybe the uploading and the descriptions writing whatever it may be right behind the scenes that they can't probably do as a team now they signed up for that deal so they have no one to blame for the but themselves especially considering the fire and the kid were previously had a bit of a falling out with fox uh you know uh, that relationship soured i think so much so now that the fire and the kid don't even own the fire and the kid 3d anymore right they can't they own the rights so they can't put it out on their on their own platforms they don't get any money from that whatsoever so they signed another deal with cast media cast media now essentially are their bosses in this podcast platform even though they once they built the fire and the kid from the ground up of course they got some help along the way i'm sure the joe rogan stamped in didn't hurt matters but essentially they built this up themselves and they essentially gave away control and now when brian callan needs to find the kid podcast the most he's not able to get on it and it was all mostly due to the cast media stepping in and saying we can't have brian callan on finding a kid because we have him on the kid you won't get any sponsors and you know for, for sure you know as great as much as they love the tfat the tfat k army you know for the most part especially in brendan's case they're definitely doing that show mostly for the money and less for the love so if they can't get sponsors or brands they're not going to do it and of course you know brian callan and his own um infinite wisdom decides to step away from it anyway himself but i'm sure he wasn't really given an option to do anything else but that but there's an interesting development logan paul and his podcast called impulsive they were also part of the cast media group right and they just announced recently on his podcast that he stepped away from cast media they decided to fire them because of some problems of their past ish episodes and i had noticed one when i watched the casey neister interview they had the audio was completely fucked up and supposedly he's saying that cast media were basically um hired to look after that entire production uploading of uh the podcast on various platforms wherever it may be cleaning up of audio and so far they've kind of put their foot off the pedal and he obviously took swift action you know and he explains some of his rationale behind the decision in this clip here again spencer's back george is fired Ooh. everyone's getting fired yeah the guys the engineers running our uh, our soundboard are not our typical engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, I fired, uh, I fired Cast everyone. Media. I fired them today. Essentially, you fired. I parked my truck in front of the gate, and Logan just came out and said, "You're fired." You don't even work for the organization. <laughs> I, I, how do you think my uh, employment was terminated here? <laughs> fired. He he goes on these firing rampages and just fires everyone. Because he's, the, he's the Christopher Columbus of the Maverick organization. Well, that's why this, that's why all this is tricky, dude. Because yep. the, the the company that has done, you know. 220 podcasts of ours mm -hmm. they've made a slew of mistakes like us I, I gave him strike one i said this is strike one i gave him strike two i said this is strike two and then i let like another two slide that they didn't know mm -hmm. even and i'll get into this on the pokemon live stream the audio was absolute garbage for the first 20 30 minutes and uh mm -hmm. we had to sh shave the the first five because there was absolutely no audio I, I had to do like sign like mime language sign mime sign language yep. sign and uh, so then what happened was i had to fire them because they didn't show up today because they don't work on columbus day i said who doesn't work on columbus yeah. day yeah. is it a government thing because last time i checked christopher columbus the racist rapist pillager who stole the lands of indigenous people right. not to be a snowflake but at what point is that fucked up i think it's just facts yeah. at this point yeah columbus <laughs> columbus day is a actual banking federal holiday well yeah. so yeah. cast media so doesn't work yeah. for so the honestly, bank like i like i said a few minutes ago you are being very columbus-esque in trying to deny cast media of their federal holiday <laughs> like honestly like that's something christopher christopher would have done and also so anyway that's basically in short so um, logan paul decided to fire cast media because of their poor uh what is that? no is that me 
wonder what that is. Yeah. He decided to fire um, Cast Media, of course, for their inability to properly produce his podcast, which makes me think, is there an act, if there, would it be right to say that Brendan Shaw, if he wanted to have his friend back on the podcast, he could fire Cast Media himself? and sign up with another production company or get his deals handled by somebody else or is he worried that with the fire and a kid being his only again not to read anyone's pockets but i'd assume the fire and a kid is his only you know and main source of income at this moment in time especially with the limited amount of touring they can do especially because the fact that they caught covid so i'm assuming a lot of clubs and places are probably going to steer off having them in some in some venues i'm assuming i don't know if that's true maybe he is i don't know i'm reading too much into it but you would hope that there'd be an option that he'd be in a position to maybe move cast media, move on from cast media just so he can get Brian Callum back on the show for some level to basically increase maybe their viewership or maybe just to kind of rekindle the magic. Cause as great as it's been in the last few weeks, I guess it's been a bit better with um, Chappelle and the other guy, Malik, I think it's his name, right? Um, it's been a lot better than the other shows. There's no denying that even if you not, if you, even if you're a hater of the fire and the kid, there's no denying that the show isn't as good as it was without Brian Callen, right? They need each other on that show. Uh, you know, it's good to get the co-host. It's good to kind of mix stuff up, but what made that show what it is, is those two guys together so you would hope that with this knowledge or him knowing what's happening you know with other high profile podcasts on the cast media platform that if he's seeing someone like logan paul do it who i'm sure he's probably contacted or he's spoken to behind the scenes i'm sure he did actually appear on impulsive um once i think a couple of years ago a couple of years ago i don't know maybe in the beginning so there is obviously a relationship there you'd imagine he'd probably want to follow suit because you know ending up in a situation where they're essentially um redoing exactly what they had what happened at fox and then you know what is it then gonna start complaining and moaning about the deal when you know why you signed it and again maybe it's cast off of more than what we know about or what we kind of being led to believe but it is interesting to see that logan paul has decided to kind of pull away from a cast and decide to move on but then brendan shaw especially knowing what brian callen's gone through and you know the 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 state of his career basically is in complete tatters even though you know, I'm sure there's things happening behind the scene that we're not aware of. It would be maybe advantageous for his friend to get back on the podcast and have an opportunity to maybe defend himself or just have the opportunity to make some money and just be funny and be a silly goose for a bit because I'm sure that's probably going to help um, take your mind off things. I don't know. But let me know what you think in the comments. What do you think? Do you think Brendan Schaub should fire Cast Media? Can he fire Cast Media? Or is he just more beholden to them because they're essentially, you know, um, keeping the lights on them, paying for his Porsches and shit? Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to know your thoughts. Next on the list, what else do we have here? Ba -ba 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 -ba. Ba -ba 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 what else do we have? What else do we have? What else do we have? Oh, talking about that actually, yeah, we have this um again um i like the guy too so it's difficult to say all this sort of stuff in there about him because i don't know what's i don't really know what's going on behind the scenes and i'm sure there's more stuff to this than we actually are kind of you know privy to but um a clip surface so i pick up the homeless cats of um brian callen and sam Tripoli's show which is I'm not, I'm not sure if it's called a conspiracy power hour or something or something along the line right they've got a conspiracy podcast that's behind a paywall on patreon um it's the only way that brian callen gets to podcast he can't do it with brendan shaw but i'm assuming because of some sort of contract um stipulation they tried to rename the fire and the kid the fire and the rings that didn't work out so he ended up with sam tripoli right who um who was kind of adam who was kind of out there as one of maybe the only comics and again i don't think they were that close prior to this show as well so which is funny in that respect but sam trippy was the only stand-up comic in that la in you know bubble who stepped out in front and said no i'm backing my friend he even went out front and stepped in front of the grenades for crystalia right he was quite forthright about defending him as well to a certain extent but you know still you have to give the guy credit right regardless of what you think of his views on conspiracies he's still a solid dude still a solid friend and a solid peer right in that industry so i kind of get the idea of doing a podcast of course you know it doesn't really make any sense considering that brian callen is you know super against uh, conspiracies but maybe that tension 
or make the show good. So far from the clips I've seen, it's not the best show. I think Sam Tripoli does a much better job on Tim Foil Hat. I think Brian, Brian Callen does a far better job on obviously the Friday Kid when he was previously there. So if anything, they're, doing, they're both doing themselves a disservice by doing this show. And like I said prior, Brian Callen's forte and skill is being a silly goose, not trying to dissect conspiracies. That aside, this clip arose of them two speaking and somehow they mentioned uh, Chris D'Elia. And for some reason, Brian Callen really, really went out of his way to distance himself from Chris again. And I don't know why this is. I don't know why this keeps happening. I don't know why he keeps trying to um, make it seem as if him and Chris O'Leary were never friends. When if you're a fan of the podcast, if you're a fan of all those people in the other comedy scene, you'd know that Brian Callan and Chris D'Elia go way back from the 10 minute podcast era when they were around each other nearly every other day they obviously gave the impression that they were really good friends they performed skits with each other they were turning up you know impromptuly at each other's shows and just you know talking about each other on every other, other podcast mentioning people's names mentioning funny stories I'll call maybe in his head for Brian Callan's head that's not friendship but to me or to anyone else looking from the outside spending that much time around somebody picking up their mannerisms working on various projects they even had a netflix show prior to the allegations that they were both working on with netflix a prank show that got scrapped because of the allegations so to now turn turn around and say you're not friends is really really odd but let me play the clip of uh brian can saying so much now and give some more thoughts on the other side so he i would i would come I, oh he's great he's like a cop he's a pure comedian yeah i don't know i the thing is i i got i'm so old that i would i would come i'd come in and out yeah, that's how you do. That's like with Delia. Like people thought I, I hung out with Chris all the time on, on the outside of. I never hung out with Chris once. Yeah. I why are you doing this? Like why? Like again, is this his? We d we don't know what's going on, but is this just an indication of just how much pressure is on him at the moment? Which you know, again, not reading anyone's pockets, but if you believe what you read on the internet, you would be led to believe, uh, or even what Brian Callan said himself, he's from a very well-off family. It's not as if you know this isn't like somebody with no connections to hollywood right if he essentially gets cancelled he's fine he could still be fine right i'm sure there's going to be moments in his life where he's going to have to you know do something else in terms of career wise to support his family but in terms of him being desolate and on the streets that's never going to happen right he's pretty well off so the stakes are not maybe as high as other people now again that's maybe um out of order to say because who's to you know who am i to judge what stakes are and what stakes are important and what aren't important he committed you know his entire life to making it in hollywood he just about got there and now he's been pulled away he's gonna do everything he can to fight to hold on to it but what how is this helping his case by coming out and saying this about chris or by coming out and dissing himself in this way how what is this really changing it's not changing anything because it's not as if he's not as if he's being accused of being an enabler it's not as if he's being accused of just sitting by idly and allowing chris to you know um solicit um nudes and whatever it may be from underage girls allegedly that's not the allegation the allegation is nothing of the sort if anything his allegations are much more serious of allegations than what chris has been accused of he's been accused of rape in brian cannon's case chris Lee has been accused of being a creep and potentially maybe talking to girls underage but if you look into the allegations that's not necessarily the case does chris have a type yes is that type um close to underage yes are they all underage no he has plenty of accounts or encounters with women where they were of age but he he didn't you know like i said prior the issue with chris is that he just didn't treat him like a, he wasn't a gentleman right he was a bit of a douche he didn't go out of his way to show these girls a quote-unquote good time he was just after one thing now again is that anything to judge a man upon no it's none of our business we don't know what these guys have to go through being as famous as they are having to tour all these no again it sounds like woe is me but you know again we're not in these people's shoes but to somehow i wouldn't imagine brian cannon could be in any position to distance himself from chris Alia, especially when you i'm saying and I think, in my opinion, Brian Cannon's allegations, um, again, only allegations, are far worse than whatever Chris Lee has been accused of. So, and again, this isn't going to save his career. This, again, my opinion. I don't know. Maybe his agents, which he doesn't have anymore, right? He's not represented by anyone at CAA anymore. I don't, I, again, it's, it's just odd. I had dinner with Chris exactly one time at Swingers at 11 at night, but I never, I never spent time socially with Chris, you know? I, or anybody. I, I, I'm, I'm I just don't old. think that exists. Whatever. And again, what's the context of, the, of this conversation? At a certain age in comedy. What's the context of the conversation? Like, 
they don't go out of each other the conversations and the kind of kinship and the rapport that they have on podcasts is all just made up for show cool let's imagine that's the case but part of the reason why these guys are successful part of the reason why they're at the top of their game is because they built a little network um of friends and that's why some of the new york comics probably hate them a lot because it's quite incestuous right they sort of all scratched each other's back if it's beneficial for one or the other they'll appear on each other's show they'll you know they'll you know uh purport to be friends on social media they'll do all these things and play nice just so that they can boost their own profiles and allow them you know to maneuver and get what they need to get to in their career and that's okay as fans i think most we kind of not understand that and we kind of see through all those kind of things but we don't have any issue with it because at the end of the day it gets it provides us with more content and it provides us with more laughs right watching this free stuff that we get to see and it gives us an idea of what we maybe are going to expect if we go see them do an actual stand-up show but i don't see personally again i don't see what this distancing from brian cannon is going to do any bit any positive anything well for his career whatsoever people have made up their minds already about him people have decided that he's a creep people have kind of got up footage of his previous shows previous comments and decided that hey this story that i've heard matches up with the guy that's doing a podcast he's guilty now is that right no of course not the same thing's happened with crystal Lear, right people are seeing how he basically goes on and bringing up sto- bringing up allegations or stories from other people that have said on podcasts to be funny and it matched up with the allegations and said yep he's guilty people are even saying by crystal Lear that because he played uh a sex a pedophile right a pedo on bloody um you that somehow that made him guilty like that's how crazy it got so for brian to sit there and somehow think um saying behind a paywall right on a podcast that probably not a lot of people listen to outside of t5k fans that he's not friends with chris D'Elia and they only hung out once is preposterous absolutely preposterous no one believes that even if that is the case what is that doing to help him again i don't believe it for one moment because i know their history from a fan's point of view it's impossible that they weren't friends right they were and they were very close but you know you don't know everything about your friends even if what is said is true about crystalia that you can't judge him for it right just because your friends no one's gonna think that you're a pedo as well but as again you have your own allegations to deal with that are far worse than this guy and again even if it is true i keep saying it again all the time even if it is true right even if everything he's saying is true and it didn't hang out with each other what is this going to do for his career and i would argue absolutely no nothing no one's going to turn around and say oh we got it completely wrong brian callen you were right all along you're an angel you didn't tell that girl now you can be my now i'm going to be your boyfriend or girlfriend or have allegation you didn't come out in flipping underwear in that changing room you didn't do all those things that you're accused of um none of this stuff is true we apologize we take it back that's not going to happen go back on your show go back on tour um sit down with joe rogan again that's not going to happen no one's going to say that and that's not the case and again you'd wish there'd be a little bit more <laughs> it's, it's interesting that i get a lot more agitated about it. i don't even know these people but you wish there'd be a lot more not even loyalty um whatever it may be just yeah maybe loyalty and friendship you don't need to keep you don't even even if someone mentions it just don't t- talk about it you're his friend you can just say no comment you just move it along you don't need to constantly um you know separate yourself and distance yourself from him just because you don't want the stink um you don't want his mark to be on you or anything because like i said i generally think his com- allegations are far worse than chris's and even if chris's allegations are bad, how bad he's the one that has to you know face up to his allegations not you it's not as if people are going to judge you based on what he'd done it's really really odd man but again let me know in the comments down below did i get it all wrong do you think why do you think actually yeah that's a question why do you think brian's even doing this why is he distancing himself from chris Alea when he has the far worse allegations or do you believe chris Alea's allegations are worse than what brian did and why is he doing this will it save his career will he ever come back from this anyway regardless and if he does is this the right way to go about it let me know in the comments down below okay what else do we have to talk about here ba, 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 ba let's go on let's move on from that one. Oh, okay oh not ooh, actually um sad news actually in this regard um i guess somehow mix mag have got a hold of the preliminary autopsy from eric murillo or because of eric miller's death they've been able to uh disclose that it was uh ruled as an accidental drug overdose this is from mix mag so eric murillo's death was a accidental drug overdose the preliminary autopsy report says murillo died of acute ketamine toxicity so as i'm sure most of you are aware eric murillo was uh found dead in his um house 
in i'm gonna say miami is it miami one of those places right and of course it's off the back of numerous people coming out and alleging um eric Murillo of some indecent instances he was due to be in court and of course you know a couple of weeks or a few weeks before that he's found dead in his place and people kind of just automatically surmised that he obviously took his own life but now the autopsy has come out and says it was supposedly an accidental overdose so this is an article here from mixed max the following eric Murillo's death has been ruled as accidental preliminary report uh by the miami-dade county medical examiner department mixed mag has obtained a copy of the report which says Murillo died of acute ketamine toxicity it also lists intoxicants intoxication from mdma and cocaine as a contributor to his death mama mia mdma cocaine and ket the preliminary toxicity was carried out by dr emma o Liu on september the second it, it states on the basis of investigation the probate man of death is the accident so no foul play no one was involved just probably him um drowning in his sorrows i guess or just trying to get some relief from whatever allegations that were there it continues here it says eric miller was found dead on the morning of september the 1st in his miami beach home um he had been due to being caught on september the 4th jesus three days before that's crazy um to face charges relating to him committing sexual battery on a woman which obviously was a story that we heard that was really egregious uh it was supposed to be involved a fellow dj's um lady of interest or something along those lines that's allegedly what i've heard and um yeah she was we kind of resisted his sexual advances she moves into another room to try and get some sleep before she goes home and then when she wakes up you know um the deceased is naked next to her bed and for some odd reason people were get people were defending eric Murillo for doing so no the people actually were defending his honor i guess when he passed because they were like hey he might have done what he'd done but let's respect him in his death but you know I don't have any opinion on because you know whatever but i do understand from the side of the women who are involved and the people who are victims of sexual assault or just women in general right to see somebody that was accused of something so heinous being essentially lauded over the timeline at the time or eulogized was really bizarre um especially when those same people will definitely be the ones to come out and say you know we have to protect women and we have to uplift female voices and stuff to go around posting pictures of him on your time and just seem a bit in poor taste and again like I mentioned previously, a lot of those eulogies weren't done um, to respect his honor. They were more done to clout chase, right? If you are really his friend, you could have easily paid your respects in private, sent his parents some money, organize or the, you know organize the organize the stuff for the funeral and the wake and whatever it may be just been there as a friend and connected with his actual real friends who aren't on the timeline there are things that you could have done if you're actually his friend but because most people aren't friends and they just pretend and they want to appear like they're cool with somebody especially when i saw people posting images of themselves or eric Mullo in the 90s and stuff right in the 80s to show law i've known him since this time it was clear what people are doing they were just cloud chasing right which is obscene to say the least right that you're cloud chasing of somebody's untimely death especially you know considering what was going on around his name at the time and then of course naturally people were upset about it and then the people that were posting you were getting upset the people that were getting upset it was just a very odd thing so i guess maybe in con in conclusion this is a good thing that i guess we got some closure in this and we can you know we can maybe if you're not respect the dead if not respect his um legacy at least respect his death right in death right so like now he's passed now that chapter has been closed and again there's no closure for the victim which is the most egregious and saddening part of this right the victims were in the process of claiming some justice in the courts but that day is never going to come but i guess you know what else can we do at this moment in time um it continues to said um da, 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 at least 10 more women have come forward with accusations which were heavy i'll let you read that link yourself of rape and sexual assault against a new born dj the autopsy case is not yet closed and a final report is expected within the next fortnight um it's interesting they're saying they still need more time to judge what's going on i don't think you can accidentally die from taking mdma cocaine and ketamine right that's obviously some sort of purposely done cocktail to just kind of knock you out i would assume for the most part right because that's a lot of heavy drugs to take in one uh in one go especially when you mix that with alcohol i would imagine right he was probably on a bit of booze as well so um those are definitely things that you do when you probably want to tap out and you've probably had enough of things and you're maybe scared to do it any other way i'm not too sure again this is me just kind of hypothesizing based on the news i've heard but 
um i guess again this maybe is an opportunity to maybe move on from this hopefully lessons can be learned as a scene as an industry i doubt it because you know the way that people were defending the things that he'd done on social media was just insane again i get it if you're his friend but again defend your friend in private go and support his parents his parents his family members whoever it may be who need his help who are kind of depending on his income you know there are ways to kind of be supportive you don't need to be arguing people on the timeline all the arguments were ridiculous um on both sides uh people not being able to understand one person's position but then again like i said the most egregious thing was seeing these djs going up on, on their timeline and deciding to post eulogies of him just so that they can show off that they know the guy before anyone else do you know what i mean so not exactly honoring his not exactly honoring his death instead of trying to profiteer off it and step sold by positioning themselves next to him but hopefully again lessons can be learned in some regard in terms of just how we protect women in the dance music scene about how people conduct themselves especially some of the higher um you know established uh djs with a bit more notoriety behind them you know just being in a place where we can treat each other with respect no matter if it's people you're sexually interested in or not there needs to be a place uh, again i argue for this prayer and i know it's naive but that's my hope that these places that we're going to these nightclubs these underground institutions they should be our safe space right because we're essentially all going there with one common interest with one common uh love right this our love for music this love for dj culture right this love for whatever genre of scene that you're in this is why we're going to these events to share these things with strangers and this space whatever it may be it captures a moment it reminds you of a certain time we should be able to provide that safe space for each other so that we can let our hair down and enjoy ourselves right Bergheim shouldn't Bergheim and these kind of places shouldn't be anomalies right most clubs should operate like this that like serve our community they should operate in this way where they provide a safe space Space for us to go and enjoy music without us feeling as if we're going to be you know um, preyed upon by some unscrupulous characters that's how it should be so again hopefully lessons are learned um, with the death of Eric Murillo it's good that we've got some sort of closure on it um, in that way of course for the victim there's no closure because he hasn't been brought to justice for the crimes that he allegedly done but hopefully this is a point where people can move on learn some lessons from it and not repeat these errors again and for all the DJs that are going on there posting eulogies about him hopefully they're ashamed of themselves because that was disgusting absolutely disgusting moving on what else do we have here to talk about da, 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 da. oh yeah this is big news so high snow buying in a few other places broke this earlier on where is it? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, I think I deleted it. So, um, High Snobiety broke this earlier, but a sneaker designer, designer I say in parentheses, in parentheses right, um, called Warren Lotus, is being sued by Nike, right, for uh, re releasing his interpretation of the iconic pigeon Dunk SB, um, you know, designed by Staple staple design jeff staple however you know you want to say that wanker's name but yeah this is the headline from high snow it says nike is suing over this blatant nyc pigeon dunk ripoff nike has issued a lawsuit against los angeles based streetwear brand warren lotus for ripping off one of his sneaker designs los angeles daily news reports according to the court papers that were filed on wednesday nike is accusing warren lotus of promoting and selling the shoe that is confusingly similar to the famed nyc pigeon sb dunk designed by jeff staple right and that's obviously the shoe i'm sure most people have seen it there's been a trend of these weird sneaker designer people popping up all over the place they're not really designers they just get a mod like i don't know a shoe surgeon is a good example right where you just pick up a jordan and you replace all the panels with luxury levers and you turn it into some walking bloody i don't know um leather museum exposition thing they, they all look terrible right for the most part they all look completely terrible but they're probably an upgrade from the whole custom uh design sort of like painting airbrushing sort of trend that happened right and for some reason they're still in trend now i don't know why i think it's naff i think it's corny i think these people need to go and actually design average their own silhouettes instead of just latching onto off the you know the hard work and the legacy of other storied brands go out and design something if you're that much of a designer if you think you're that influential if you think your stuff is that cool why don't you make your own shoe they never do that they just take the work that's already been done and just slap their own logo on it lazy boring shit and i saw on the, i've seen this logo right this sort of like um ski mask halloween sort of shit he's got on the side of the swooshes so what he basically was saying in his captions right 
uh, regarding the shoe itself was that somehow he was picking up these shoes or making them from the ground up. That's what he was basically saying, right? And I think I've got a bit of the same here. Da, da, da. But he was basically saying something along the lines of like, oh, I'm making these shoes from the ground up with an Italian factory. Like I'm basically taking a pigeon dunk, deconstructing it and making it myself, which is complete bull be bullshit, especially in the era where there's fake shoes from China and other um, replica shoemakers out there making some high level shit that's falling places like StockX, Goat, um, you know, whatever other place you're selling at to suggest that or to kind of give the impression or sell this story that you're somehow creating a shoe from the bottom up is ludicrous. We all know what the game is. The game is a game. He was buying shoes from China and essentially putting his own logo on the side of it. That was the extent of his hard work. And that's essentially what ended up biting him in the ass. So whatever he was trying to proposition, he was trying to put forward that he was this kind of, um, you know, um, forward thinking, um, subversive, sort of like the sneaker version of fucking Banksy, whatever he's got in his head has essentially come and bit him in the ass, all right, right, for doing this, because he decided that, hey, I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this silhouette, I'm going to take these iconic colorways of, you know, ironically, they're all the iconic SBs as well, it's not even like he's taking some, uh, you know, uh, unknown colorway, some shoe that didn't sell too well, and then trying to re-elevate it and sort of like recontexting it that way telling a different story that would be a far more interesting take a far more interesting sell it's just taking the bait issue right this what next the paris dunk the london dunk yeah we know they go for a lot of money this isn't you're not saying anything interesting and then he's slapping his logo on it and then nike said enough of that the article says the following as you can see by looking at the picture of the original dunk above and the one loads variation below they look almost identical because they are they're just they're just fakes that he's put this logo on you know that's basically it um and it continues that as a direct proximate result of the warren lotus wrongful acts nike has um suffered continues to suffer and or is likely to suffer damage of its trademark business reputation and goodwill um unless the restrained warren lotus will continue to use uh the swoosh design mark or confusingly similar marks and will cause irreparable damage to nike for which nike has no adequate remedy at law as daily news points out nike is asking los angeles federal judge to order Warren Lotus to stop manufacturing and selling the fake dunks the brand will, is also seeking damages which is the big one it's not just a cease and desist because I got one of those before from Nike for doing some other stuff which I won't mention but he's not even getting that he's also being flipping they're seeking damages so they're going to take him to the cleaners right especially again this guy probably made what not that much money off of them he probably didn't even send them out on time right he doesn't have that many original ideas anyway so this is definitely going to kill him the band is also seeking damages and any of the profits earned as a result of warren lotus acts um in violation of the nike's rights furthermore it is worthy of note that whether directly involved with warren lotus shoe or not nike has left jeff staple who holds a registered trademark for the pigeon graphic out of the lawsuit which is very interesting because i think according to fashion demics which is the page that i follow the most for all this kind of news so definitely check them out they're basically alleging that nike unfollowed jeff staple on instagram which is sweet sweet justice for such an absolute weapon right there's no more there's no more less talented um um stale uh lacking in innovation or inspiration guy or just lucky to be there right he's the quintessential lucky to be there he happened to be around streetwear happened to be around the proximity of the scene as it was burgeoning with his crappy store and his crappy brand he happened to be the only one that had a connection with certain people within nike ecosystem he connected a couple of people and he's just been riding the success of this one shoe his entire career in streetwear he's done nothing cool nothing of note since that shoe dropped and if anything he's been regurgitating the same tie design you're telling me actually you're being too harsh you're being too harsh let's go back onto the original article and scroll down look at this story from six months ago right where's the story from seven months ago there's a story here says jeff staple turns his iconic pigeon dunk into a luxe marble sculpture in 2020 he's turning a pigeon dunk that came out when in 2000 eh? when did this pigeon dunk originally come out 2000 something i don't know whatever the original year was he's still riding off the back of that right more than 10 years ago shoe he's now turning into some sort of luxury what marble what thing that you put on top of your flipping uh desk of your desk or something like what is that who needs this bullshit absolutely gunk so it it is sweet justice that somebody lacking in such innovation who was you know essentially only 
regurgitating the Nike pigeon dunk design just so he could make sure he's on the seating list of shoes has been essentially booted off and told to get out of here because he decided to what link up with Warren Lotus to again guess what breathe new life into an old design shoe that he made so again I've got those I've got I, I, I've got no what you got sympathy for him being let go in that regard you know there's probably high time they have a bit of fresh blood at Nike anyway doing that role whatever he was doing because he's stale as fuck it continues here so Jeff Staples design Pigeon Dunk are uh, one of the most covered Nike sneakers have released an original pair recently sold at auction for a whopping 25,000 of course some money needs to be made from that but bloody hell man what absolute numb nuts in it all of them involved Warren Lotus for trying to um, su succeed off the back of, you know, a pretty um, well-known bait dunk, um, which essentially highlighted, again, exposed where he gets his shoes because there's no other place you can get this apart from the rep markets, especially brand new. Most of the, especially in this condition, especially with the amount of sizes that are available now, he's p potentially fucked up the entire resale uh, market for this shoe. Because if you're smart, you're going to buy a really good rep of these, store them or stack them underneath your wardrobe somewhere for a couple of years. There's not many shoes pigeon dunks a reference from out there in the market anyway i'm pretty sure some will slip through the net and you know some um unlucky saw out there is going to be um you know wanking over a pair of pigeon dunks that they have no idea have just come from some factory somewhere in china they've made in someone's back garden in under 30 minutes and ugh, again man just it goes to showing it is the, the lack of originality from the fashion brands in terms of the sneakers that they always copy and not don't design their own silhouettes and also the kids involved in streetwear and sneakers themselves who just work off the back of the betas models don't try and make their own shoes they don't all pull in their resources and make them because again making your own shoes is probably the most expensive thing to do in fashion hands down right it's the most expensive right making shoes is hands down the most expensive but it also if you're about this life and you're really about this creativity life and you think you could do a far better job than some of these designers at nike that's what you should be actually doing specking up and designing your own shoes maybe sending those samples and those illustrations and those actual concepts and those ideas off to some of the big brands again to hire you instead of just deconstructing shoes supposedly right adding python leather to it and calling that a fucking collaboration it's not it's not and again it's not me defending nike at all because i'm you know fuck nike to the day that i die but still this is garbage bro who's buying this nonsense in it like what is that like literally what is that but again um that's what that, that's what you get from like, having original ideas isn't it you get sued you get cease this is and you get sued for damages let's see how that plays out in the next few weeks anyway that is excellent doing show episode number 389 thanks so much for tuning in as per usual it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if you're watching via youtube make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below that'll be much appreciated and if you're listening via the podcast that please leave me a fast side review and share the show with your friends and i'll see you guys again very very soon until then take care be safe bye bye <laughs>